Good morning, everyone. My name is Nana Dagadu, and I'm a research officer at the Institute for Reproductive Health at Georgetown University. I'll be your moderator for this morning's webinar, It Takes a Village, Supporting the Transition of Boys and Girls into Puberty. This webinar is the second in a series brought to you by the Very Young Adolescent Alliance, which is comprised of Plan International, the Institute for Reproductive Health at Georgetown University, Save the Children, and DSW. Our discussion today is going to focus on the ecological framework. You will hear an overview of the conceptual model and then brief presentations highlighting programs representative of each level of the ecological framework. These presentations will set the groundwork for discussion during a Q&A session, so please be sure to write in any questions you have during the course of the webinar in the chat box at the bottom right of your GoToWebinar screen. To help foster some rich discussion, we will select cross-cutting questions and we'll respond to clarifying questions or questions we don't get to answer in a written format following the webinar. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce the first presenter for the day. Susan Egress has over 20 years of experience in research to practice health programming and results-oriented management. Her work in adolescent sexual and reproductive health and gender ranges from guiding strategy development and organizational integration of adolescent and youth sexual and reproductive health programs to providing program design and evaluation assistance. Over the past six years, her ASRH work has focused increasingly on issues affecting younger adolescents. Welcome, Susan. Thank you, Nana. Um, I'd like to set the stage for the presentations that follow by taking you through a socio-ecological approach to VYA programming. We use this model in our 2014 article on investing in very young adolescents sexual and reproductive health in the Journal of Global Public Health to organize and analyze it, the available global information on VYA programs, policies, and research evaluation gaps and to make the case for early investment in very young adolescents to establish a strong foundation for later relationships in older adolescent and adult years and achieving good sexual and reproductive health. So the model you see appeared in a 2012 Lancet special issue on adolescent health. And it's quite interesting because this particular framework proposed two dimensions, the multi-layered ecological, but also a life course dimension to highlight the interrelatedness of social elements and individuals' lived life experiences. The, the socio-ecological framework recognizes the complex interplay between individuals, school, family, neighborhood, and society factors, and the overlapping rings in this model illustrate how factors at one level influence factors at another level. It allows us to understand the range of factors that put adolescents at risk or protect them from poor sexual and reproductive health. And the life course dimension, which is at the bottom of the page, I think you can see it, recognizes that we all come from history and life contexts that inform our current attitudes, beliefs, and choices. We all have lived life experiences, and from these experiences, individuals construct their own pathways through their choices and actions. These experiences are also a function of the opportunities and constraints in uh, historical and social circumstances that each person finds himself in. And these two dimensions are interrelated and socially reinforced. So we, so we took the Bloom model and colleagues and adjusted it more specifically to younger adolescents. And you can see um, the def definition doesn't change that much. Um, more emphasis on including emerging gender and sexual identities. But in recognition that VYAs live through a particular life course moment that sets them apart from older adolescents. They're going through puberty and the rapid body and emotional changes that occur, changes in comfort with their body that occur. And this all occurs in a very short time frame. And this includes emerging fertility, girls having their first period and boys experiencing their first nocturnal emissions. At this point, society starts to treat them differently. Girls and boys start to be groomed for adult female and male roles. 
For example, household chores that may have been shared earlier by boys and girls become the responsibility of girls. And if it's, that is not enough, it's during these rapid BYA years that a young person's gender and sexuality are forming, which affects later attitudes in adult years, beliefs, values, and behaviors. If you look at the next level, the, um, the family and social levels, the, basically it's a way to, to think uh, programmatically, but also conceptually about the relationships that may increase the probability of experiencing positive or less positive sexual and reproductive health. A VYA's closest social circle, parents and other family members, peers, teachers, influence their behavior and contributes to their range of experience. Neighborhoods, similar, and uh, focusing really on the workplaces and neighborhoods and how characteristics of the neighborhoods in which VYAs live are associated with or with ensuring or menacing healthy adolescents and societal that really help create a climate in which gender and sexual and reproductive health are encouraged or inhibited. So poverty, social and cultural norms, formal state policy, policies. I'd like to briefly share with you some quotations from IRH's research and evaluations to help illustrate the interconnectivity and how life experience and gender and concerns about sexuality manifest at all levels. So we're just going to quickly go through, starting with the individual level. This is from a BYA girl in Rwanda. And from a boy in Uganda. and from uh, young, yeah, younger adolescents in Madagascar and Nigeria. You can see from these quotations how puberty can affect the younger adolescent's sense of self, of comfort with self, and in these last slides in particular how newfound fertility can start to set up power differentials that favor boys over girls. And these attitudes are reinforced by both sexes. Looking at some quotations and at some um, perspectives at family and neighborhood level from a VYA boy in Nepal. And another quote from a mother of a, a younger adolescent girl in Rwanda, sort of the family perspective. I'm trying to tab down to the next, but it is not working. And from someone who works in an NGO that's working with very young adolescents, their perspectives from his own personal view. So these quotes really highlight how gender role expectations, how sexual and reproductive health play out in family and neighborhood settings, and social pressures is not, are not just on the VYAs, but also the families and the parents to conform, and, and, and how once awareness is created at one level through a program that can lead to new ideas and actions, they can actually butt against the different layers and, communicate, and butt against family and community expectations of what is acceptable for a VYA girl or a parent and sometimes close out opportunities for the very young adolescents. Schools and other services, sort of the structural um, aspects that serve to, to create sexual reproductive health and gender um, influences and even policies. So you can see that the, the different layers, parental, community, and policy norms, help serve to reinforce what choices very young adolescents have, behaviors and relationships that can lead to poor adult sexual and reproductive health. Community institutions such as schools, which should play a protective role, often have structural issues that are influenced by gender and cultural norms that diminish protection, particularly for girls in schools. Uh, 
uh, if the desired outcome of VYA programming is to arrive at healthy VYAs, then we really need to work at different levels to have a sustained impact. And at the same time, um, we have to recognize that that life course dimension requires tailoring VYA information and services. So whether they are poor, whether they're living with HIV, whether they are in school, in stable households, all of these um, should be influencing a tailoring of information. So programmatically then, what is needed to build a firm foundation for later sexual and reproductive health? You see sort of divided by the life phase, life course phase, a focus on body, fertility, gender awareness, strong self-esteem, decision making, and not really while knowledge is important, um, it's really not sufficient to, to navigate puberty successfully. And recognizing, again, across those social layers and the ecological model, if you want to sustain VYA's healthy transitions, you really need to be working at different levels. So our challenge is the field really is nascent, and the challenge for VYA programming is to understand what information and skills are age appropriate and necessary throughout the 10 to 14 years. This is a really nice quote um, from, again, from Uganda, and it's something that I've heard in different countries that I've been working on this issue, and that we really have to be able to distinguish between um, what makes this kind of group different, and what does that mean in terms of content and approaches that you use for programs. So our call to action as a global community um, are some quotes that we have been uh, presented at meetings that are also in this article. And one is really the paradigm shift about a more global view of prevention and harm reduction that begins at the social level and filters down through the different layers of that model. And really the need of research on very young adolescent age group to help people, um, to help provide more guidance to policy and actions and programs. Thank you. Great, thank you, Susan. Our next panelist is Dr. Health and Development on issues ranging from ranging from improving access to essential medicines to humanitarian relief in conflict settings. Dr. Soma's particular areas of expertise include conducting participatory research with adolescents, understanding and promoting healthy transitions to adulthood, the intersection of public health and education, gender and sexual health, and the implementation and evaluation of adolescent-focused interventions. Welcome, Dr. Soma. Uh, thanks very much, and it was it's wonderful to be on this panel and to hear Susan's presentation just now, um, which I think did a great job of um, setting the stage. Um, so I'm going to talk briefly about what I'm calling the Puberty Book Project, which when you look at the ecological model, is particularly focused on the individual level, so it was that inner concentric circle. Uh, much of the work that I do on menstrual hygiene management and with girls really reaches um, multiple levels of intervention, um, but this is the one that I'm going to focus on um, right now. Okay, so just waiting for the slide to maybe shift. Uh, okay, so the first time I menstruated, I felt very bad. I felt like I would die. When I started for the first time, I did not understand myself. I saw that my underpants were stained by blood. I went and told the story to my sister because I thought that if I told the story to my mother, she would think that I had a bad behavior. This quote came from research in Tanzania that I did in 2009, but similar to the slides you just saw, it's an experience uh, that a girl expressed that we've now heard in multiple countries. Um, moving on to the next slide, and I won't read this one out loud, but this came from 
uh, a boy that we did research with in 2011 where he talks about the first time he had a wet dream, essentially a nocturnal emission, thinking similar to the girl in the prior slide who thought something was very wrong with her, thinking that he had a disease, and also emphasizing in this quote, as we heard in <clears throat> subsequent research with other boys, and we're now hearing in other countries, he didn't really know who to talk to, and as a young man, didn't think it was appropriate, necessary to, uh, appropriate to talk to anybody. This research we decided to undertake after doing the research with girls uh, earlier and realizing that while many people were concerned about girls, there were, there were also obvious concerns that boys were not having their questions answered and of course boys impact girls' experiences, which is something to uh, be better understood. Um, So very young adolescence, as I think was just highlighted in the prior presentation, is a window of opportunity. Uh, that's the perspective that I see. I think in particular, uh, girls are getting their periods for the first time. Boys' bodies are changing in fundamental ways as well. Um, and often it is a period of life before young people start to engage in high-risk behaviors. Um, and so I see this, and I think many people see this, as a window of opportunity at which to reach young people before they start engaging in unsafe sex or consuming alcohol or taking other risky behaviors, with some evidence out there that this early intervention, particularly when it comes to safer sex practices, can be effective or more effective waiting till they're older. Um, So the Puberty Book Project aims to fill a gap in girls' and boys' puberty knowledge, something that we've now learned about in multiple countries, similarly to what was highlighted in the prior presentation. We found in, I've done research in Ghana, Ethiopia, Cambodia, um, and Tanzania, and doing research in Pakistan now, that girls and boys do not have adequate knowledge about the changes that are happening to their bodies. Um, we feel that this project, which I'll talk a little bit more about, builds girls' and boys' levels of confidence and self-esteem, um, that a lot of them are experiencing fear and confusion about the changes that are happening to their bodies. And so this is, well, knowledge is not sufficient. Um, this is one way to at least start to give them the information they need and to reassure them that what they're experiencing is normal and is just part of growing up. And then we also have found in, in most places we've worked that parents are uncomfortable talking to young people about this or traditionally it was not their role to do so. And so we found that by providing these books to young people to share with their parents, to share with their siblings, it's a way to open the doors of communication um, and increase the conversation. So the first book that we developed was in Tanzania in 2009. Um, it was approved by the Ministry of Education mm -hmm. in 2010. Um, the book is focused on 10 to 14 year olds and was developed through very careful participatory research conducted with Tanzanian adolescent girls who we had reflect on their puberty experience. The book has content on early puberty and on how to manage their menstruation. And once we got approval from the ministry, we, there has been a lot of support uh, from the ministry, from the UN, from NGOs, and we've distributed over 420,000 copies so far. Here's just some examples of pages inside the books. Um, all the books that we develop have both English and the predominant local language. We hire local illustrators, we hire local translators, we hire local publishing companies so that the books become more, they, they, they culturally are as appropriate and of the context as possible and can be ordered locally forevermore and don't need someone from the outside uh, negotiating um, when people want orders. So, on the, and, and all the books includes menstrual stories that girls write about their first periods and their advice for younger girls, which we think is a nice way for older adolescents in that country to be providing guidance and support to younger adolescents. So as I mentioned, while we had the original book in Tanzania, the book has now been adapted to three other countries. All have been approved by the local ministries of education. Um, and all through a partnership that we have with World Reader can either be ordered, ordered hard copy directly from the publishers in the country 
or can be downloaded mostly for free on e-readers, phones, mobile devices. Um, we're currently developing a book for girls in Pakistan and we'll be starting a book in Madagascar in a few months. The books take about four months of research in each new country. They're not simply translations, but they're actual adaptations through careful research with stakeholders and girls in each new country. So how are they distributed? So we've designed the books knowing how overburdened the school systems are in a lot of these countries and how busy the teachers are and also knowing a lot of teachers may not be comfortable talking about some of these topics. Um, while the teachers are welcome to use these books, they're designed to be a simple enough reading level and um, appropriate content that they can be given to girls directly to take home to share with parents, out of school girls, um, siblings, whoever they feel might be interested. As I mentioned, they're always published locally, um, and they are distributed through whoever orders them directly. They decide how they want to distribute them, be it to church puberty trainings, NGOs working with this age group, ministries of education distributing them to schools, and so on. So across the four countries, we've distributed over 800,000 copies, although clearly there's many more girls that still need to read the books. So we do some very small evaluations. We haven't had the funding to do large-scale evaluations, but I just wanted to highlight this is a picture of some girls in Ghana. Um, but the feedback we've gotten from girls, we had predicted that girls would think that other girls should read this book when we asked them the question, who should read this book? And 100% in all the countries, they always say other girls should read this book. But what's been particularly interesting is that in the different countries, we've had girls, many girls, say they want their mothers, aunties, and grandmothers to read this book. Sometimes they say they want their teachers to read the book. Um, in Ghana, for example, they ask that their father should read this book. Um, similarly in Ethiopia and in some of the countries they suggest that boys read the book so they'll understand girls bodies and what's happening to girls and be more supportive. So speaking of boys, um, after a number of years working with girls it became very apparent to me that and others that we needed to be paying attention to boys as well. Uh, they have sort of an absence of adequate information themselves. They struggle, but quietly usually, because they don't know who to talk to, and often it's not masculine to talk to somebody. And they also obviously can negatively impact girls. So it became very clear um, that we needed to start developing books for boys to be handed out when we gave out books for girls. So the first book was done in Tanzania. It includes content not just on body changes, but also on gender dynamics between girls and boys. Boys wrote stories we included in the book about peer pressures, um, about violence in their lives, and also some information about girls' body changes. There were 15,000 that we originally distributed, and the government of Tanzania with UNICEF just ordered a, a huge amount. And we're about to finish up a Cambodia book and hope to start working on other boys' books soon. So just some pictures from the boys' book. Similarly, it's in English and whatever the local language is. It includes content, as I said, on boys' body changes, but also this content on peer pressures and girls' bodies and violence and, and other important content of relevance. So just to get close to wrapping up, um, we are aiming with this project to reach girls and boys at the individual level. Um, it fills a gap, we feel, um, in the activities that are focused on menstrual hygiene management for girls. Girls obviously still need, as it's a challenge, they need water and toilets in schools. Information alone cannot solve the challenges they face. But we do think that providing them with basic guidance and knowledge will build their self-esteem and confidence, um, increase both girls' and boys' levels of comfort in school and around each other while their bodies are changing. Um, having the Ministry of Education approve the books, publishing it locally, aids with the acceptance. But a challenge remains reminding them that they want to keep ordering it each year and that we want to keep reaching young people who are reaching age 10 and 11 in these countries sustainably over the coming years. It's significant and relevant, I think, because we found that they are incredibly popular, which without even doing a rigorous evaluation tells me it's important. Um, there's a lot of countries out there where girls and boys do not yet have books, and so I would love to see other organizations, which some are already doing, such as Save the Children, um, developing books like these. Um, and more organization, I think, in partnership with governments is always preferable because then you can really aim to go to scale. 
So thank you. Just so you know, all the PDF files for all of the five books that are online so far are available at the link below. You just click on the cover image of the book and it will take you to the PDF file. And if there are additional questions, then please feel free to email me. Thank you, Marnie. Um, I'd just like to take a quick second to remind our webinar participants to please submit any questions that you have in the chat window at the bottom right of your screen. Um, and then we will be sorting them and uh, responding to them during the question and answer session later. So I'd like to introduce the next panelist, Sony Pradhan has more than 12 years experience working in women's empowerment, gender-based violence, child rights, social inclusion and project management, and managing community development projects and ensuring high quality results. As the gender and social inclusion specialist with Save the Children, she has been responsible for mainstreaming gender and social inclusion throughout all thematic sectors including child protection, governance, livelihoods, health, and education. Welcome, Sony. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, today I'm here to present the Catalyzing Positive Gender Norms for Mission Among Very Young Arisen by Targeting Parents. But before going to the pre presentation, I would like to thank Susan and Dr. Sommer for the wonderful presentation. Uh, here I am today, I I'll be presenting uh, about the, sorry, uh, I'm, I'm here to present about the Save the Children gender norm packages that we have been implementing in, in Nepal. Uh, as explained by Sushan, the ecological model, we have uh, the different packages that focused at the individual level, at the family level, and at the community level. And simply we give the name choices, promises, and voices. But I, I will be more exp talking about voices today. Uh, at the household level. So Voices is a program, is an approach targeting parents to change their gender norm behavior towards their very young adolescents. Uh, these gender norms behaviors are, uh, this are shown by the six videos. The six videos are developed and, and are based in emotional uh, behavior and these six videos are the testimonials of the parents of the father and mother we have just recently adopted the gender norm behaviors the six gender norm behaviors are on the simple but very practical gender norm that exist in the society in the household level they are evenly divided household tasks equal amount of time for the homework for both boys and their girls equal food for boys and girls encourage the daughter to attend school in the same way they do to boys committed to do Delay, in delay marriage for the daughter, equally bring hope to girls and boys. So these six are the key gendered behaviors that the videos try to address and through emotional testimonials. And right there you can see a picture of a very uh, uh, handy, a very comfortable equipment that we say Pico projector which can be taken to a very remote villages where there even there is no electricity and this works with the with the solar charger. So these voices are are actually we saw th there are six videos based on this six gender norm behaviors, and these are shown to the and these videos are targeted to the parents, both mother and fathers. Uh, let me move to the next slide. The voices, as I said, that these are targeted to the fathers and mothers. Mothers engage after the videos are videos are shown. The mothers and fathers the they start the reflection and dialogue that leads to the behavior change and followed by the commitment on gender norms changes. That what after looking that videos they will be changing their behavior in their household. So this video highlights mainly the voices and fathers of fathers and mothers who have recently made changes on the gender norms. The group discussion asks husband and wife to, dis to discuss, reflect, and come to a commitment for joint parenting on changing gender norm behaviors. This group discussion is very powerful because 
it's it's like um, the te it's it's on as I mentioned earlier it's a emotional testimonial videos and that really influence the parents or the you know like encourage the parents to change themselves but the one thing it's very difficult to you know reach to the uh, fathers men because usually they are working and it's very hard for them for to get their time so that's why the special uh, targeted specific requirement strategies followed that like prior to the videos, uh, video program two or three days earlier go and talk to the parents at the household level and make sure that both the husband and wife are participating in the uh, event in the in the program uh, I just want to move to the next slide So as I mentioned earlier, this video is powerful because parents in the villages are often less literate. So the method of using video is very useful. They can understand, they understand the context, they understand the issue, and they can easily uh, think and reflect on it. Parents have less time for long curricula, so the approach is is very against. It's, it's very powerful because they don't have much time. They have to go out for the work. Uh, both the mother and father in the community they have lots of work so it's very short and it's very powerful it's not it doesn't contain any long curricula these three group sessions for the six videos three group sessions are organized and it each session two videos are shown and followed by discussion as I, I as I mentioned earlier the discussion is in re, they reflect each other there's the the facilitators who's there encourage both the husband and wife to talk, to reflect each other, to dialogue and come into a commitment. So so at the end of the session or, or the end of the, act, the uh, intervention activities, the parents and uh, parents, the mother and father, they, they make some commitment that what they are going to do in, at their household level. So once they make the commitment, there is also, uh, uh, they also can record their voice. The project has also, the, this program has also introduced the IVR system, that is uh, intra voice response system, where the parents, those, whoever wants to commit or whoever thinks they have already done this in their houses, the changes on gender norm among their very young adolescents, they can just stand up and they can uh, dial the number, which is toll free number. It doesn't cut any cost, can record their voice. So the voices, is very much uh, powerful to make changes at the household level on the gender norm, uh, gender norm, evaluate gender norms of the very young adolescents. Uh, so, so just to summarize, uh, this is my last slide. Just to summarize, the working with parents as mentioned in the ecological model is very important and very powerful to change the gender norms values among very young adolescents. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Sony. Our next presenter was going to be Anne Sizamu, who is the National Team Coordinator for advocacy at DSW Uganda. Unfortunately, she was unable to join us due to some technical difficulties. We will be sending you her slides um, following the webinar, so please look out for those. In her place, we are going to continue right along. We're, we're going to actually, there's a question. Um, if you want to ask a question to any of the panelists or a general question um, for a discussion, there is a chat window at the bottom of your screen where you have, um, after the list of participants, there should be a smaller window that says chat and you should see um, a place to write in your comments if you type them in our moderators will look through the questions and be sure to get them um, read out when we do the Q&A session. Hopefully that clarifies it and then I think um, our, our tech support will help you maybe further if you're, if you're still lost on that. Thanks. Um, the next panelist 
is Dr. Pamela Young, who specializes in program design and implementation, strategic planning and management, and business development in long-term development and emergency settings. As a program director at Plan International, with 20 years of international experience, she focuses on education, child protection, and orphans and vulnerable children. She has served as an organizational representative and leader on national and global committees, including the Interagency Task Team on Education and HIV AIDS and the Global Education Cluster. Welcome. Thank you, Nana, and also thank you to my fellow panelists. Um, today I'll be presenting on community responses to addressing child marriage. PLAN as an organization works on child marriage issues uh, in many places throughout the world, uh, throughout Asia as well as in Africa. The specific project that I'm going to be talking about today is a project which we are implementing in Bangladesh with generous funding support from USAID. The project is called Protecting Human Rights. This project is a five-year project and it started, as you can see, with the aim to reduce domestic violence and other gender-based violence issues. Uh, two of the issues which came out very quickly with regards to gender-based violence were sexual harassment as well as child marriage. PLAN is addressing this issue through an integrated, grassroots, and multifaceted approach. And what I mean by that is PLAN is looking at the issue of child marriage, domestic violence, through issues of protection, education, health, economic development, and water and sanitation. And as my other presenters have talked about, the issues of looking at it at a multiple levels, PLAN also focuses at this as using our child-centered community development approach, which looks at uh, implementation from the community level all the way up to the national level. The project that we're implementing uh, is in six different districts throughout the country. Um, and you can see from this map we are in uh, very different areas of the country, uh, Barguna, Bogra, Chittagong, Dinaspur, Jeshwar, and Salet, a number of upazilas, as well as working at the union level. In terms of our target population, we work with a wide range of actors, and I'll get into a little bit more of the interventions we do with each one of those actors. Um, we work with men, women, we work with young girls, we work with boys, we work with um, individuals who are members of the government, the media. So there's a wide range of actors because we feel and we have felt that um, when we're working with the community, there's so many people that are involved with the community and if we really want to make a difference and make a change when it comes to addressing gender-based violence issues and addressing the issue of child marriage, we certainly needed to work with a wide range of uh, target populations, community leaders, as well as religious leaders. In terms of the age range of those who that we work with, uh, again, the age also varies, uh, and it depends on the target group that we're working on at any given time. So we work with um, young girls and boys from about the age of uh, 11 or 12 years old up to older individuals who may be in their 50s and 60s. Now, as we're talking about specifically health issues and issues related to child marriage, um, through our programs, we've come up with three sort of general areas where we're seeing that there's a lot of health consequences of child marriage. And I just want to briefly highlight a few of those for you. As you can see, I've grouped them into three general areas. The first are reproductive health issues. Um, the, there are issues with um, young girls particularly uh, their lack of awareness about pregnancy, sexual intercourse, and contraception. Uh, if we're talking about young girls who are um, taken from their households at a very young age, they are bring, brought into a marriage, they often become pregnant um, very quickly, and they have to deal with um, 
uh, issues related to the health of their unborn child or even their newborn child. Uh, there's a lot of complications that result um, through pregnancy. Um, and a lot of times these young girls um, do not have or are not fully equipped this, with the skills to be able to address any of the reproductive health issues that they may face individually. There's also mental health concerns that these young girls face. Uh, these girls are taken from their home. They enter into new households because they often go to live with their in-laws. And they're all of a sudden exposed to new roles at a very young age. These are adult roles. Um, they're often subjected to um, uh, the, the, um, the directions of the members of that household. And that includes not only their husbands, but it also can be their in-laws. The research that we did in Bangladesh when we first started the project found that over half of the um, women that we talked with were uh, victims of domestic violence, and we're talking about physical violence as well as emotional violence. Um, and when we um, are talking about uh, the issues within their household, uh, we found that a lot of times it's mother-in-laws who were some of the perpetrators of emotional abuse. Um, the young girls that um, uh, go into these households um, may be subjected to non-consensual sex. There could be both marital rape as well as rape from other members of that household. Um, and they often um, suffer from issues of confidence and low self-esteem. Then the third issue and the third area that I just wanted to mention is the overall health and hygiene issues. When we talk about health and hygiene, uh, many times these young girls um, are not exposed or provide with the knowledge, awareness, and education when it comes to overall health and hygiene. So as I mentioned, uh, with the implementation of our Protecting Human Rights project, we have been working at multiple levels, um, from the community level all the way up to the national level. And really what we have been doing is helping to strengthen the systems at these multiple levels. Um, at the national level, we've been really working with enforcing um, or helping to make sure that laws are established within the country to address uh, the needs of young girls and women. Um, we work with uh, the division and the UPAZILA levels to really make sure that there's advocacy and that there's access to services. And then as this presentation is really talking about the community level, we've been doing quite a bit of work at the community level with uh, local social workers as well as the formation of social protection groups. Um, these social workers, before we started this project, there were very, very few in the country. We have now 102 um, social workers, uh, sorry, 204 social workers, so we have two in each community. We started with 102 and we doubled that number because we found there was such a great need. These are social workers, these are members of the community um, who are uh, approachable by um, young girls and women to really help with counseling, to help with counseling uh, both the individuals as well as the family members and to provide them with uh, access and helping them to access legal services, medical services, any sort of livelihood services that they may need. Um, And a little bit more about what we have been doing to try and address the issues of child marriage. Um, in addition to training these social workers and having these social workers in the community to help provide the counseling skills um, to both survivors of domestic violence but those who might find themselves uh, subjected to or the potential of child marriage, we've helped to form and activate social protection groups. These are community-based um, groups of individuals, and they include uh, community leaders, religious leaders, um, teachers, those uh, medical professionals, those people who have standing in the community. And they really serve as a point of call for anyone in the community um, that has an opportunity to come and talk to them about uh, any of the challenges that they've been facing. And what we've found is that, uh, remarkably, we've been managed to stop in just the last two years um, nearly 900 child marriages, uh, working with the social protection groups, working with family members, and also working with the local government officials so that they can make sure to provide that um, support and standing. 
Uh, in addition to training of social workers, we've also been training many others. We train social medical professionals, um, we've been training lawyers, we've been training judges. Um, I should mention that when it comes to lawyers, we've helped to set up legal um, uh, protection systems or legal centers, and that's a place where um, young women can and, and, and women of any age really can go and access their legal counsel and legal advice um, so that they can be protected by the law. Um, as you can see, we are also working with the government to, ch to strengthen the Child Marriage Restraint Act, um, which was from 1929. Um, so it's rather an old act, and so we have been working quite closely with the government to strengthen that act because um, the Domestic Violence Act and the rules um, of, for domestic violence have now been passed and are now being implemented, but we found that in addition to domestic violence, we needed to also um, strengthen the Child Marriage Restraint Act and also there is no sexual harassment law in the country and we are also working with the government and our partner organizations to uh, develop a sexual harassment uh, law. In addition to um, uh, the capacity building awareness, we're also um, uh, working with young people. So we have created both a schools program and a youth clubs program. The schools program started in 10 schools and now we're in over 100 schools. And this is working with young people to help them to understand um, issues around gender-based violence and particularly have uh, modules on child marriage. Um, we've also formed youth clubs and this is an initiative that we initially did not have as part of the project and we developed at a later stage because we realized if we really wanted to make a difference you know, training um, the social workers, having these social protection groups, having the school programs. One of the biggest part of all of this was to also make sure that the youth were actively engaged and they have been very actively engaged. So uh, these youth clubs are an opportunity for them to uh, discuss issues and child marriage is certainly one that has come up over and over and over again. And then also to advocate and share awareness with their peers. Um, so, and then the last thing I just wanted to mention in terms of the social protection groups and the work that we're doing is um, they have what are called courtyard meetings. Um, these courtyard meetings are an opportunity. They just sit down in the middle of a courtyard for a local village and with our local organizations that we're worked with, uh, it's an opportunity for people to talk. Um, we have a game that we created, the Snakes and Ladders game. Some of you might be aware and we've adapted it to this very issue. And it's really exciting to see, originally we started, it was a very small group, it was mostly women, and, and when you go to these communities now, you see that it's not just the women, sometimes it's couples um, who will come together, and that's really exciting to see these couples together playing this game. You get everybody in the community involved, the young children are coming as well, so it's kind of a nice add-on effect to the work that is being done. So I'd like to thank you very much for taking the time, and I'll be happy to answer any questions you have. Great. Thank you very much, Pamela. Um, I have some good news for everyone. Our um, final panelist, Anne Stizamu, has been able to join us. Um, Anne is currently the National Team Coordinator for Advocacy at DSW Uganda. Her current role is, major, is majorly policy en engagement and advocacy for reproductive health and adolescent health. She played a crucial role in establishing the Adolescent Health Working Group in 2011 and led the first technical consultation on very young adolescents in Uganda in 2013. Welcome, Anne. Sophie and uh, oh yes, um, thank you everyone um, who has managed to present, and I'm going to share um, about the Young Adolescent Project that um, uh, we implemented here in Uganda and uh, the lessons learned. Um, the Adolescent Project um, increasing the section reproductive health knowledge. Um, wait, I'm trying to have the slides transition. Okay, um, just hold on. Okay, thank you. Um, so we 
looked at uh, three, uh, four areas that was increasing um, the knowledge of young adolescents in primary school. Here, yeah, primary school ideally ranges 6 to uh, 13 years, but our concentration was uh, 10 to 14. Then also create support of parents and guardian teachers and the community leaders to support uh, sexual health of young adolescents. Then increase utilization and referral of uh, quality youth friendly services, as well as sharing the lessons um, um, learned. In doing this, uh, the target group that uh, we focused on was uh, young people 10 to 14 who are the primary beneficiaries, then teachers, parents, and community leaders and health workers were actually the second beneficiary. And our target uh, was 10 primary schools in three districts in Uganda. So how did we, uh, how were we able to reach, to use the different, uh, uh, to use the ecological model in terms of reaching um, the young adolescents? At the individual level, a lot of activities concentrated on building skills through training in life skills and leadership for the young adolescents, peer education, and then encouraging participation of uh, young adolescents in, um, in activities, both at the school level and uh, at, in the community, where they were able to reach out also to other young people. It's also important to note that uh, personal relationships are very key to young adolescents. And uh, in doing this, they try so much to influence each other, and we need to create positive relationship across that um, age group. So in doing this, we created the 10 youth clubs in the schools where uh, the program was, and then um, we trained the young people as peer educators so that we can promote exchange of information through discussions, as well as supporting um, them to manage the youth clubs with support from the teachers and parents. On, in addition, the teachers were also trained too so that they can work um, with young people who were trained and actually support them in the school environment. At community level, the involvement uh, of the community was very key in terms of uh, ensuring that the program succeeds. And uh, this in, um, involved not just the community or the villages around, but also the, the health centers that were surrounding the schools. And linkages were also created between the schools and health centers to really make the referral a reality because uh, there are issues or health issues that were beyond the school environment. And health workers were trained in the provision of adolescent-friendly services. And uh, one of the other things that we did was introduce the family health days in the schools where there was HIV counseling, um, uh, free medical, you know, camps for parents, teachers, and the young people, or the young adolescents. And uh, in addition to that, we had dialogues. And in these dialogues, we had a wide range of topics, some were on sexual abuse, there's a lot of sexual abuse uh, which was reported by the young adolescents, early marriages as well as teenage pregnancy and growing up as well as school dropout um, were some of the issues that were discussed in the, in the dialogues. In terms of the, of the factors that uh, um, we looked at is that uh, it's very important to look at uh, then the very young adolescent from the point of view that the social norms that still exist even in in Uganda or in other places like um, other presenters have mentioned, and uh, it's still uh, not easy for parents to necessarily discuss sexual issues. So the parental dominance still exists for this uh, uh, specific age group. And uh, because the parents are also very close to the young adolescents and want to know what is it that, y y what sort of information are you giving to their children, that provided an opportunity uh, for parents also to be integrated in the project and them actively participating in the project because they wanted to know what happens. And the open dialogue.
the obstacles were involving the teachers, parents, and adolescents also proved to be a very good strategy as adolescents were able to articulate their own needs and parents understood the need to provide them with the timely information and uh, how we also train them how can it be done. And at the policy level there's um, a lot of uh, really working together with the Ministry of Education and the District uh, Education Department to ensure that um, uh, whatever we doing uh, adheres to the standards but also we were able to input into you know um, policy documents at that at that level. In terms of um, how this can be, um, the lessons that we were learned along the way. One is that uh, it's uh, sometimes important at the start to use a phase approach because this was for us a pilot, so we spent uh, time in um, one, the first year doing more of the awareness and capacity building for the teachers and then um, the adolescent and the phase two, uh, a lot of um, the effort was put in terms of uh, knowledge transfer and building structures. The phase three was mainly for imparting the knowledge to the adolescent to increase their participation within the program. And then um, the last stage was really uh, to do with the sustainability and being able to really um, wind up or wrap up the project so that uh, then the schools are able to, to take it on. In terms of um, uh, the key achievements, we see that uh, there was a high level of the parental ownership. More young people, about 7,000 were reached out and uh, teachers' awareness and skills in terms of passing on the knowledge regarding HIV was also increased uh, at this level, as well as the health workers that were trained were able to reach out to the families and also the young people at that level. Um, next. Okay. Um, there's also a relationship between uh, really the school dropout and the information provided and this uh, is something that we are able to see in all the schools that there was decrease the schools and then the district reported decrease in school dropout as a result of intervention. Remember the issue was really concentrating on the knowledge and then the skills for for young adolescents but one of the things that actually resulted was actually the reduction in the school dropout at that level. Um, next. We also saw that um, across from the baseline to the final evaluation, there was a very high increase um, among the young adolescents on regarding the knowledge on teenage pregnancy, meaning that they are able to tell how do they get pregnant, what does it mean when you start menstruation. They also got knowledge about family planning, which was uh, tailored uh, to them, which was uh, very key in terms of uh, uh, prevention and because it was one of the things that were was raised as an issue within their schools leading to the dropout. Next. In terms of the lessons learned, as I wrap up, one was the, the holistic integration which is very key. The program needs to you really take on a whole approach for adolescents to be rich. We know this is an age where they're still very close to their parents, so it is very important that uh, we involve the school, the community, the family, then uh, you know the health workers so that the adolescents can really benefit. Then research and documentation um, uh, should, is a must because we need to learn there's uh, still little really research around uh, reaching the very young adolescents so it is very important that when we are doing this the 
uh, it's, we are able to really document and then um, other places, other countries and in different places it's, it's possible to replicate uh, what we've been able to do. So far we know this has been done in Kenya, so it's, uh, they're implementing a three-year uh, project with the young adolescents and with the documentation that was done, really it was uh, just an orientation and they were able to really localize it in the coastal region. Then local ownership is very key because the community is really very protective uh, with the very young adolescents, so to ensure that uh, we succeed, that there is need for ownership. And uh, lastly, the assumption that teachers can easily pass on the SRH knowledge and skills is not necessarily right in our case. So we need to strengthen the teachers' skills and knowledge to ensure that they are able to support the very young adolescent and also create the multiplier effect because the trained teachers then reach out to more of the uh, adolescents too. Next, okay. Then um, it's also very important, um, like you said, to facilitate local ownership for the target group, as you can see from one of the pictures, and also enabling positive behavior change among young people. It's very, very important. And uh, one of the quotes that uh, we really got from a young girl in one of the districts where we put is uh, that she felt that she was empowered and said, with the many trainings for parents and children, my father now buys sanitary parts and sometimes sits and talks with me on issues of sexuality, unlike before when we did not share anything. So it is very important that uh, still the young people believe that the parents are the best source to get uh, information regarding their sexuality and it's the very key that we need to emphasize this. And uh, we managed to document all this so you can go online and you can be able to access the, the how to reach uh, young adolescents and if you need more information um, you can please um, uh, email us on the email below, we'll be able to get back to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anne, and thank you to all our panelists for your excellent presentations. Um, unfortunately, we have now passed our allotted time for the webinar, so we will be unable to um, really go into discussion of the questions that were submitted, but I did want to give you all a sense of some of the questions that did come in. There were some clarifying questions around the actual age brackets for very young adolescents, which is 10 to 14. Um, a lot of you are actually asking about special populations of youth, including low literacy youth and out of school youth. Um, and people wanted to know some of the challenges with working with um, diverse stakeholders. And then finally, questions around why and how you worked with boys. Um, so we will be sending out a, a follow-up email with the presentations as well as various resources that go along with the presentations. We will compile the questions and answers from the panelists and send that, uh, send that out as well in the follow-up email. But from my end, I would like to thank you all for your active participation and interest in today's webinar. We hope you enjoyed the information. And um, just a few key reminders. In addition to looking out for the follow-up email, Please also go to the K4 Health website to check out the Very Young Adolescents Resource Library, um, where a lot of these materials and others from other organizations are posted as well. Um, and then finally, look out for uh, an advertisement for the upcoming fall webinar from the VYA Alliance, which will feature um, results and discussion around the great project, the Gender Roles, Equality, and Transformations project, which actually deals with one of your questions around the use of game-based tools um, for this age group. So thank you, everyone, and hope to see you soon. Have a great day.